welcome to Ask the Educator, a podcast brought to you by Healthmark Industries. Are you a sterile processing technician or manager? Maybe you work in infection prevention or biomedical engineering. Whether you're a frontline tech, endoscopy tech, OR nurse, or surgical services administrator, you undoubtedly have influence in medical device processing at your facility. In each episode, we speak with experts from the Healthmark Clinical Affairs team, industry leaders, or special guests from the trenches to answer your questions and bring you relevant industry information, equipping you for excellence in medical device processing. My name is Kevin Anderson, and I will be your host. Now let's get started. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Ask the Educator podcast. My name is Adam Okada, co-host of the Ask the Educator podcast, along with the host, Kevin Anderson. Kevin, how are you doing? Doing well, man. Let's add to our ST91 block of podcasts here and help everybody out. Absolutely. So in case you are just joining us, this is another one of our ST91 series. You can go back and listen to our first one with Marianne Drosnock talking about what is ST91, where it came from. This is a brand new document. We go into all of those kinds of things. So go back and listen to that one if you're just tuning in. But if you want to hear John Whelan talk about storage, handling, post-processing, all of these kinds of things, then you are in the right place because John is about to talk about that. Welcome in, John. Hey, Adam. How are you, Kevin? We're doing good. Doing well, man. Glad to have you back. And yep. uh, we'll just keep chipping away at this standard. Exactly. We're going to get into drying post-processing on this episode. And drying is a really important part. And what we realized over time from the old standards to these new standards, we realized how important drying was to the process. There was a lot of studies specifically by Ofsted and Associates about water that was left inside the channels. Can you talk a little bit about what drove these changes to the document and then a little bit about the background behind them? Yeah, so like you say, Adam, the clinical investigations as well as research that's been done in recent years uh, really is what drove the content and the considerable attention that's being paid in ST91 to active drying post-processing. So it seems like it shouldn't have had taken research and clinical investigations to prove this, but especially for channeled endoscopes, but even non-channeled endoscopes, scopes that remain wet, harbor the opportunity for bacteria as well as biofilm development. When you're talking about channeled scopes, channels being hidden, moisture is retained in there for days and weeks. They were able to prove with boroscopic inspection. So that's what's driven a lot of the content and emphasis on drying post-processing. So regarding the drying uh, post-processing, there's a couple of things that I think about. Number one is what quality, I guess, of air? Are there specifications around this drying procedure that we need to be aware of? I know that you're going to have to dry the external surfaces of the endoscope, right? But what about the internal surfaces like the channels and those nooks and crannies that a lot of these scopes now have? Yeah, and I think it's good to start with where have we been and, and where are we headed? So where we've been, we haven't been doing it um, historically. <laughs> and a lot of people assume, well, I put a scope in an AER and it washes high-level disinfects. It's got an alcohol cycle. It's got an air cycle. So it has air. All that is is an air purge. That's not meant to be a validated drying cycle to make sure that the channel, for example, is dry. And anyone that's ever lifted a scope out of an AER knows that it's dripping water. The scope remains coiled in the AER. So as long as it remains coiled, there's going to be water left, regardless of an alcohol purge or an air purge. So just lifting a scope out, the outside of it's wet, the inside of it's wet. So as far as the drying that needs to occur, it's active filtered forced air drying. And we need to incorporate the newer technologies that are made to deliver air, filtered forced air at a certain pressure. A lot of people automatically assume, well, similar to what's done in an SPD area, I can just take an air gun and point it at the proximal end of a channel and call it good. Well, you've probably dried to some extent the port and the first part of that channel, but you haven't gotten the air all the way down the channel. So that's not considered the best option either. So what we're talking about, tabletop, wall-mounted options that 
are made to deliver air at the appropriate pressure for a minimum of 10 minutes. So it's pressure regulated forced instrument air or a minimum of HEPA filtered air. Excellent. So the second thing I wanted to touch on with this is after figuring out what type of air we need to accomplish this goal, we were talking before the podcast and how it can be common for folks to use the same endoscope five, six, seven times a day. Question that comes up is, is there really time in between to perform this drying part of the, you're saying 10 minutes. Do I have that 10 minutes? A lot of times what people do is out of an AER and it's going right into a procedure room. And I remember from my former experience, I remember there were other places in the health system that were talking about if it's going right to another room, what's the issue with drying? What do we really need to do that? So I wanted to address that question too, because I think that's going to be a really prominent one when it comes to drying. If we're going right back into the endo procedure room with it, is it really critical that we perform this drying step? So I lived through that too as well, Kevin, where we only had so many scopes. Famously, you only have what you need. You don't have extra. So for example, on a day when there's a lot of upper endoscopes being performed and you've got your MA or your tech parked right in front of the AER waiting to take the scope out so they can run it to the next procedure. So we make a distinct point in ST91 of saying that whether the scope is headed to a procedure or to storage, it needs to be dried for a minimum of 10 minutes first. Why are we saying that? We're not saying that just to say that, but similar to what we said in previous podcasts, you want to create processes that are sustainable and consistent and standardized regardless so that if they're ever interrupted, you know that the quality is maintained. So what happens if you take a scope out of an AER, well-meaning to go right to the next procedure, and it doesn't get used or it's delayed in getting used. Again, you've allowed the opportunity for biofilm development, which only takes minutes. And you always want to create standardized processes that are same regardless. So we, again, point out that whether it's post-AER, we are drying the scope actively either in a drying cabinet or actively drying it before it leaves the processing space. I would really like the 10 minute minimum, just kind of as a standard, you'd have to have that same process every single time, giving the scope time to get that drying in between. Uh, again, because we don't know, you, we are well-intentioned, we remove the scope from the AER, but we don't know that every time it's going to get used immediately. So I think that having that in there is a really important step in the standards to really help with that kind of standardization. And then there's another thing that I really wanted to clarify because it's something I see online quite a bit that kind of gets people riled up about, oh, I need to go purchase all these new cabinets and things like that. Can you talk about the storage cabinet specifically? What are the, what are the standards say is here's the minimum and what are they asking for as a preferred method? Yep. So that's a very good question. And I run into that a lot too. So what ST91 says is drying cabinets are preferred, but minimally cabinets with filtered air blowing into them is acceptable. So it doesn't mean everybody's got to run out and buy very expensive drying cabinets. If you have the opportunity to do that, think of a standard being updated or replaced that's based on best practice and based on clinical investigations and research as your opportunity to have the ammunition, if you will, that you need to seek funding as you're able to, to get to the next level. The term standard refers to achieving a certain level of performance. And that's what this is about. The whole document speaks to best practice. And we were very realistic in our conversations. Sometimes the conversations took quite a long time, as you guys know, but we kept reminding ourselves, this is a user document. Not everybody is able to afford the same level but we need to say what a standard should be and why, what it's based on, and then have that as the expectation. When it comes to drying cabinets, yes, they're preferred. That doesn't mean they're obligatory. And so what should be gone, though, is the days of having famously built-in laminate cabinets that have no ventilation other than a little circular passive air vent in them. That was a standard for years that you saw it. 
you need to have air blowing into the cabinet to dry the outside of the scope and create a drying environment, if you will, for a scope that's hanging there. Adam, do you feel like that touched on what you were hoping? Correct. And that's the idea that when the standard says something is preferred, it's sort of like, well, look, if you're in the market for a new cabinet anyway, yep. here's yep. what the standard says is preferred. Try to go for this if you can, because this is yes. shown pre a better results than the alternatives. So that's all that standard is saying. But yep. if you have an existing cabinet that's compliant and it has HEPA filtered air, it uh, does all the things minimally that we want, then you're fine with that because that's the minimum standard. So I think there's just this disconnect between, and by the way, talking about like the, well, you had the laminate cabinets with no hair. I've seen a lot of different storage cabinets. The best one I've ever seen, and I haven't told you guys a story yet, was a wooden cabinet. It was built in someone's garage and they knew there was an air filtration requirement. So they drilled holes in the side of the cabinet to allow air ventilation to get in. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing the standards are meant to stop, right? I mean, we're yes, not wanting people yes. to invent new and interesting ways of getting storage and air ventilation in, right? Right. So we want to get away from the build-a-bear mentality, you know, with uh, endoscope storage cabinets. We need to be using cabinets that have the appropriate surfaces that are cleanable and intact surfaces. So I, I run into it, too, as you guys have, where you'll see holes in the back walls or the side walls of cabinets where either other hangers or other things were mounted at points in time and never filled in or your you know homemade cabinets like you're talking about where it's not really a cleanable surface so the other thing to reinforce and this isn't anything new this has been in other standards and guidelines before this is no endoscope storage in a procedure room and ideally, it would not be in the processing room unless you have a uh, complete dirty to clean flow in a one room processing room. And then it would be at the very cleanest end of that space. But the preference is that it's in its own clean storage room. Yeah, that's a good point. I know if, I'm, I'm sure all of us have seen places where we had uh, clean or processed endoscopes right there in the procedure room. I know that was something that, that we had for various models there was some reserve storage right there in the procedure room so yeah it's a good idea to get away from that considering the procedure room uh what happens in there so i find kevin uh, as you probably have that when i'm standing in a the decontam space of an end processing area i'm reminding people assume this whole room is contaminated because it is because of the aerosolization that occurs from manual washing in here and so when it comes to wearing PPE, you need to pay attention to that, but you need to pay attention to that for anything else that's in the room. So the dirty to clean flow matters, the separation of spaces matter, and that's why an endoscopic procedure room is also has aerosolization and also has contamination. That's why we need to not have scopes stored in there, patient-ready scopes. Yeah, it makes perfect sense to me. I think it probably makes sense to everyone out there. It's just when you live in those arenas every day and work in them, it's something that you like, it doesn't dawn on you like yep. it does until it's written in black and white in a standard somewhere. It's really easy to kind of like not think about it. It's taking fresh eyes in there and maybe rounding with somebody from IP or whatever yep. they might notice. But since you work there every day, it kind of flies under the radar. So I'm glad you brought that up. You know, too, that historically it was all a matter of what's the most convenient. And yes, it was convenient to have the scope right in the procedure room, right? Stored there. Sure. But the people that drove the design of both endoscopy procedure rooms as well as processing rooms usually were not basing it on a clinical standard. They were basing it on architectural standards or their own creative ideas. So that's why commonly, you know, unless you have the input from IP and people that actually do the work, you're not going to have correct lighting. You're not going to have the air ventilation where it should be, and you're not going to have the spacing. So I guess I want to point out, too, that the very beginning of the document where we talk about physical spaces has a lot of good information about how to design the processing space, the entire processing space and what should be considered in that. Yeah, I think that's very important because there are a lot of people who need or are 
maybe in the beginning of phase of planning a, a modernization of their area or what have you. And I mean, we see it a lot on social media where people are doing sterile processing projects and redoing the entire department. That same thing could happen for endoscopy and having some guidance on how to do that properly is is huge. Yeah, that's the support too that you can take to leadership yep. and facilities administration IP and say, here, this is the direction right here for how we should be doing this. Exactly. One other thing we wanted to touch on with this particular episode. So we've we've gone through drying post-processing, a little bit of storage and the drying cabinets and all of that. We wanted to also talk about the handling of a clean and processed endoscope. This is a big deal. This is something I remember even surveyors years ago were kind of already starting to point out in our process when people were improperly handling these processed endoscopes. It's something, again, you know, until somebody comes in from the outside, sometimes you don't even realize it's happening. But what, is the, what does the standard have to say about this? Right. So clean gloves should be used for handling scopes post high level disinfection. So removal from the AER, removal from the storage cabinet and scopes should be have a visual cue on them to point out that they've been processed. But when you remove a scope from a cabinet for a procedure, it should go into a solid container for solid container transport. Again, even if you're only going across the hall or down the hall, you don't carry the scope in your hands. You pointed out that people oftentimes practice, and it's not until somebody points out what they're doing or asks them, do you realize what you're doing, that they realize the significance. It's not been uncommon historically for people to just carry scopes in their hands, whether they had gloves on or not, and go through a doorway. Well, how'd you get through the doorway magically without touching the door handle while you're holding a patient-ready scope? We actually got cited a couple times by Joint Commission at facilities for them observing that, that you're holding a patient-ready post-HLD scope in your hands, but you're going through the doorway to get out of the space where the scopes are stored and into the endoscopy procedure room. So, All right. Thank you, John. Really appreciate the time and talking about storage and handling post-processing here on endoscopy and the new ST91. So we're out of time for this, but we are going to have John back to talk about the annexes to SD91. The annexes are a very important part at the end of that document, and John will be back to talk about that. All right, so we're out of time for today, but thank you for tuning into the Ask the Educator podcast. Thank you to Kevin Anderson. Thank you to John Whelan for being here, and we'll see you on the next one. All opinions expressed on this show are those of the presenters. Before using any medical device, it is important to review the device manufacturer's instructions for use.